الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم للشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيدي ولدي آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هدي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا وهم عن الآخرة هم غافلون أو لم يتفكروا في أنفسهم ما خلق الله السماوات والأرض وما بينهما إلا بالحق وأجل مسمى وإن كثيرا من الناس بلقاء ربهم لكافرون أو لم يسيروا في الأرض فينظروا كيف كان عاقبة الذين من قبلهم كانوا أشد منهم قوة وأثاروا الأرض وعمروها وأكثر مما عمروها وجاءتهم رسلهم بالبينات فما كان الله ليظلمهم ولكن كانوا أنفسهم يظلمون ثم كان عاقبة الذين تساءوا السوء أن كذبوا بآيات الله وكانوا به يستهزئون رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحن العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا صالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين رب العالمين Today is a rather broad topic, but I wanted to try to narrow it down so that we can, we can take some practical guidance with us from Allah's book. Today, what I'm going to choose to talk to you about are a small section of ayat from Surah Al-Rum. That's the 30th surah of the Quran. And I started uh, thinking about this surah because recently I was out somewhere and I saw a, a painting of one of the Roman ruins. It was just a, just a painting on the wall in a restaurant. And I just took a look at it and it got me thinking about some things. And um, I thought it's worthy of reminding myself and all of you of some of the lessons that Allah has taught us about that. So here's what it is. Allah gave human beings certain desires from the moment of their, the way they were created. Allah says, And he made a list of things that were beautified for people. And one of those embedded needs that human beings have is the need for power, the need for control and power. And power is defined by many things. So we, when we think of power, you can think of, you know, a, a general or an, a leader of a nation or a king of a, of a country, an ancient king, or today the president or a prime minister of a country having a lot of political power. They have the power to command an army. They have a power to make executive decisions. That's a kind of power. But there are other kinds of power too. There's financial power, right? There are people that, that have a lot of money. They have the power to hire lots of people and fire lots of people. They have the, fire, but the power to invest in places that nobody's ever invested in before and turn a barren desert into a thriving city. They can do that. So money has the power to bring about a lot of changes in the world, right? So financial power is a kind of power too, not just political power. Social power is also another kind of power, the power of influence. When you can influence and sway people's opinions or people's people's uh, emotions, you can you can have an influence over what makes people angry or what makes people upset or what makes people excited, right? Then you, then you can get to influence their behavior. They can start buying things you would want them to buy, or they can start voting the way you would want them to vote. So social power actually then starts influencing where the way money flows and the way politics flow, 
right? So the first two things were politics and money, and the third one, social influence, has a bearing on the other two. So social power is also another kind of power. And when we, when we think of these things and think of this big word, power, or a, a close equivalent, not exactly the equivalent of that in Arabic is quwa, then again, we think of big powers, big businesses, multi-billion dollar enterprises. We think of like Amazons or something, right? Or we think of presidencies, or we think of multimedia you know, corporations uh, that, that influence people you know, intellectually, news organizations, things like that, right? But let's start at the very bottom. Allah has given all of us, every one of us, rizq. And Allah has first and foremost given us power to control our body. He's given me the power to lift my hand, to move my tongue. He's given me the power to see. He's given me the power to think. At the individual level, he gave me power over this body of mine. And in fact, not only did he give me a power over this body, every time those of you that are here for Jumu'ah today, and many of you that are commuting every single day, we get inside of our cars, or you get you sit on your bicycle, or you sit on your donkey, or your, it doesn't matter what ride you have. Subhanallah, sakhara lana hada wa ma kunna lahum wa inna ila rabbina lahum qalibun. When we make that dua, we're actually acknowledging that Allah has overpowered this device, this vehicle for our service. So it gets to be under our control. It takes the left turn and the right turn when we want it to because Allah has su submitted it for us. He surrendered that device or that animal to our service, right? So we, we exercise that kind of power and we need it. We, we need some level of power to exist in life. It is, it is this ability, this empowerment that Allah gave you and me that allows us to earn our living that allows us to provide for ourselves, that allows us to take care of ourselves and others around us. So there are, every one of us has some level of power, but then there are degrees of it. So now imagine somebody who didn't have a job and felt useless, felt powerless. And then Allah enabled them with some financial ability by getting them a job, right? The way they see themselves has changed. They saw themselves in the mirror and they saw a loser. They saw somebody who can't get anything done in life. Everybody looks down on them. They're worthless. And now they have a really good job. All of a sudden, they have a really good job. And the way they see themselves has changed. And in fact, even the way other people see them now, they can see people look at me differently. They don't have that look of dis. My mother doesn't have the look of disappointment on her face anymore. Right? My friends see me differently. My father looks at me differently. You're, you're, you're seeing a change in perception around you. And it's making you feel more and more empowered. Right? So it's not just what you feel about yourself. Others can reinforce that feeling, right? You never had a car in your life. And then finally, you have enough money that you bought yourself a car. You'll feel like you just own the planet Earth when you're driving around. It could be a 1978 Cutlass Sierra, but you're driving around like you own the road. Like, yeah, four wheels and an engine. What's up with that? What you know about that? You know, like, because you just accomplished something that you never imagined accomplishing before. It's relative, isn't it? But then what happens? Then you see someone else who's driving, you know, the new M5. And they're driving by, they're driving on the same road, right? And th in that moment, you're in your own world and you don't even imagine that you can ever compete with that. That's not your world. That's just some other universe. That's not for you, right? What, what has Allah done in this world? Allah has given some people more wealth than others. Allah has given some people more physical ability than others. Allah has given some people more social influence than others, right? And you'll notice something that if there were, there were people that were weak, in some way, in financial sense, in the social sense, in the political sense, in whatever sense, they were weak. And then Allah gave them power. Allah gave them, en enabled them in some way. Then their personality also starts changing. They become different. They're not like they used to be. The way they act, the way they treat other people is starting to change. Because people see them differently, now they get used to that and they don't want to be seen the way they used to be seen before. So somebody, if you had a bunch of friends in high school and you were always goofing around, making jokes with each other, they're just a bunch of guys, right? You're just friends among each other. But 10 years go by and you own a multi-million dollar business and, or you're the, the other friend is like the head of a hospital and he's the surgeon, surgeon general of a country or whatever. They're very accomplished people, right? You know, when you go back to your old friends, some people, when they go back to their old friends, they're still the same way they were when they were 15, 16, 17 years old, right? Others say, I'm not that kid anymore, okay? I'm a big deal now. You better recognize what a big deal I am now. It's not like how it used to be. Like they feel the need to make sure you realize that now I am in a position of power. 
so I need to be looked at and perceived differently. What got me wondering is that this, this different degrees of power that Allah has given us, I've seen it in life. I've seen people that are very accomplished. Allah has given me the opportunity to meet with people that are, you know, that, that are at the very bottom of the economic ladder. You know, people whose families were starving and they basically got a work, they got a job somewhere, you know, lifting bricks or driving a taxi for 20 hours in a day just to make enough to feed their family back home, right? And they don't even take a day off for three, four years in a row. People like that. I met people like that. Then I've also met presidents of countries. I've also met kings. I've also met people that run multi-million dollar, billion dollar corporations. People that have been casual conversation, they're like, yeah, alhamdulillah, it was a slow year. It was only 27 million. I'm just, I've, had, I've met people like that too, you know? So you see people with, Allah has given them different degrees of rizq, different degrees of power, different degrees of influence. And the disparity is incredible, isn't it? It's just absolutely incredible. But you know what's crazy? Sometimes you meet people that are at the highest levels of power. They're at the highest levels of power. And you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it. I've met people that, like, young guy, actually maybe three, two, three years older than me. I met him 10 years ago, right? And he started, he was a tech whiz. Started, I won't name him or his company. So he started his, you know, a website. It took off. He sold it. He it went public. He sold it. Before he was 20, he, had, he was worth $350 million, right? And when I met him, it was an entrepreneur's conference. Right? And when I met him, he was just wearing like a Walmart t-shirt and some Gap jeans and just sitting around with everybody else. Like nobody knows who this guy is. It's some, it was he even part of, and everybody else was wearing like expensive suits and like, you know, they're at this formal thing. And this guy who's worth more than all of them combined is just sitting there in like a t-shirt and some slippers because that's not what he's about. And he's just very easygoing. And then you meet people that, you know, for the first time they made six figures, right? For the first time they got received a title, right? And now they're making, I don't know, maybe a, a hundred thousand, a million dollars a year, which is a big deal, it's a lot of money. But it's nothing compared to this other guy. But the moment they hit that one million, man, they get the Fir'aun complex. Huh. You know, I laugh in Ardi, they're walking around like, do you realize who I am? And they need to make sure that the car they drive or the clothes they wear or the way they dress or the way the 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 way they talk to people it's it it screams million bucks they need the world to know that they have this power they need to make an impression on the world and you know what when you look at history when you travel the world you see a lot of ruins right you see ancient roman ruins you see you know colosseum you see the the the, the you know the, the the obelisks that the egyptians built Remarkable architecture. But you know what? A lot of that architecture was not because it was needed. It was just there to make a statement. It was there to intimidate. It was there to show what we can do. A lot of the ancient Egyptians, for example, built architecture for the purpose of intimidating people that would travel by, by river. So they would see their monuments and say, whoa, don't mess with these people. Look at what they've done. Look at what they've accomplished. So human beings have had not just the desire to acquire power, but to show it. There's one thing that you have ability, you have money, you have power, you have influence. It's another when you feel the need to let everybody know, they need to feel it. You understand? They need to feel what you have. And unless you can make somebody feel it, you're, there's a hollowness inside you, right? And this is, this is the wild thing about this. Allah has given some people so little and they feel like they need to demonstrate it. But when Allah gives more and gives more and gives more and gives more, but the, you could be on top of the world and still feel insecure, still feel like until people, sh people acknowledge me, I'm still worthless. Until people show reverence to me, I'm still worthless. So someone can reach the level of Fir'aun, right? And he feels so worthless on his own that he needs to say, Ana rabbukum al I am your most supreme God. I am your highest master. <clears throat> you know, we, you all know he called himself God, right? The Pharaoh called himself God. But think about that psychologically for a moment. What does that mean? The concept of Allah, the concept of a Rabb is someone who is worshipped, right? Someone who is surrendered to. 
someone who is revered, someone who people, someone who people pray to, ask to. And he's already got the power where people come to him and they ask him for financial help. People come to him and ask him for security because he runs the nation. He already has all those powers where people come in need from him. But he needs to go beyond that and he needs to make sure that people acknowledge it and revere him in a way that he wants to be seen as a god himself. So you don't have to have Firaun's level of power. You could just be, uh, you know, like the head of your household. You could just be the oldest brother, the oldest sister. You could just have just a little tiny bit of power over your younger siblings. It's not that much power. It's not like Firaun versus the Israelites. Just a little bit of power. You could be the manager of the store, the 7-Eleven down the street. You're the manager. You got a little tiny bit of power over the other couple of employees. You don't own the 7-Eleven. You're just the manager, bro. You just, you're, you're the, you're, you know, you're the head <laughs> chef at the restaurant. You're an employee. You got a bunch of other chefs working for you. You've got a little bit of power over them, right? But you know what? The, the, the same insecurity that the Firaun had, you can develop. It's such a powerful drug that you need to make sure they recognize how powerful you are. You need to make sure to, inf and, and some people do this, you know why the only way they can do it? The only way they can, they can feel powerful is when they inflict pain on someone else and then say, what are you gonna do about it? They'll say things that are hurtful and then say, what are you gonna do about it? They're gonna impose themselves, be bullies, be mean, but just because they can, because they, uh, otherwise they won't feel powerful. What, what good is this power if I can't do anything with it? I should you know, throw that whip around a little bit. I should lash others a little bit. And Allah, Allah acknowledges that drug. Power is a very, it's, it's, it's a drug. I call this khutbah the power of power. Because the more someone gets it, the more drunk they can become on it. The more drunk they can become. And, and the more hurtful, the more dangerous they can become. And what happens? People have this dream that they want to get there. They just one day they want to have enough power that they will, man, when I have this much money, watch what I'm going to do. And some people in their mind, they don't even have, when I have this much money, I'll have this kind of house, this kind of car, this kind of family, this kind of this, I'll give this charity. You know what they have? When I make that money, you know what, who, whose house I'm going to drive in front of? I'm going to take my Ferrari and pull over in front of that guy's house and say, what's up now? Because <laughs> even in your head, your, your sense of accomplishment is incomplete until you can bring somebody else down or put them in their place, right? That's what's going on in your head. So it's not even about yourself. That's, it's not even about yourself. So what does Allah say about all of this? And how do we compare that to the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ? By the way, non-Muslims, non-Muslims, look at Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And you know what they say? Not us, non-Muslims. They say he spent 23 years trying to get power over Arabia. Listen to this carefully. Their claim is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All he did this entire time was convince a bunch of people so they could give him power so they could, he could run the entire region. Right? It was just a political scam. In fact, that is the accusation that the hypocrites made against the Rasul in Medina. That it's not a new accusation. Munafiqun had already made that accusation in Medina. And the Meccans, when they were trying to cut a deal with the Prophet assumed that's what he wants also. That's why they said, what do you want? You want power? We'll hand it to you. We'll give it to you. What do you want? Let's make a deal. Because they don't know anyone who's driven to accomplish something unless they're in pursuit of what? Power. Of some kind. Social, economic, political, but it's got to be one of them. What else is there? Right? So you get, you finally get there and then you can say, I made it. I've accomplished. Right? So what is it? If you look at it from the non-Muslim point of view, Rasulullah is given victory over Makkah nearly at the end of his 23 years. Right? So the, the 23 years of Risala. So he's in his early 60s, and now Makkah has finally been conquered. And if the goal was power, the goal was power, then this is the time where you get to enjoy, now that it's been, now that I have the kingdom, now that I have the control and the power, now I get to live like a king. Now I get to enjoy like a king. Because I finally have something I've been fighting for all this time, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal gives him victory. And before he even gives him victory, he says, by the way, the moment that victory comes, it's not yours. It's the aid of Allah that came. And people will be conquered, not by you. They're not going to enter into surrender to the king or the ruler or the prophet even. 
You're going to see people entering into Allah's deen. All this, this entire mission of Rasulullah where it looks like he acquired power, and Allah says all of that was so people don't recognize Rasulullah so the people recognize Allah himself. So the people recognize Allah. And when you reach that, you've accomplished your mission. Now people recognize Allah, which means you have nothing more to accomplish in this life for, for, uh, for people than you just do, reconnect to Allah. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ You just do tasbih of your Rabb and seek his forgiveness. And Sahaba understood that that means that the Prophet's mission is done. Allah will call him back. It's not that he's now the ruler, so he gets to enjoy the, his reign as a ruler for another 30, 40 years. That's not what he was sent for. He was sent to accomplish a mission, and the mission was to bring Allah's deen to humanity. He's done with that. That's the victory. That's the victory. He, he's not interested in, the, in power itself, for himself. That's, that was never his mission. And his joy was actually to do tasbih of Allah. So now look what Allah says to the Quraysh. He says to them, didn't they go around in the earth? Didn't they take a good look? What came? What was the outcome of those who came a long time before them? They were much powerful, much more powerful than them when it came, much more intense when it came to power. Quraysh obviously had power. They and they exerted their power to undermine the Prophet. And Allah says, put this in perspective, Quraysh. You live in mud houses in the middle of the desert. That's where you live. That's the reality of it. Have you not traveled and done business towards the Rome, Roman Empire, towards the Persian Empire? To, and on your way, have, not, have you not seen the ruins of previous nations that built homes that were much more elaborate than your own? Do you not see that people before you were way more powerful than you can even imagine to be? Do you not, do you not recognize that? Do you not have any sense of perspective? As powerful as you think you are with your million dollars a year, do you not see that people before, just look at a Roman ruin, for example. You know, people say, I made a lot of money, I'm building this fancy mansion. You cannot compare a fancy mansion today with even one of the, ro uh, the a, ro a ruin of the ancient Egyptians. Like the budget it must have taken to build one of those monstrosities, to build one of those things. You can't even imagine. Like the level of power Allah had given to people before is just on a different scale. It's a completely different scale. So Allah says, if you think you're so big, you, there are people much bigger than you that I've dealt with already. Why do you think you're so untouchable? So he says, they were much more powerful than them. And they made their mark on the earth. Look at these words. They made their mark on the earth. They left imprints on the earth. You can see the Great Wall of China even by satellite. You can even see it from there. People, human beings made their mark on the earth with these monuments that even those ruins are visited by tourists today. What, what do you think you're going to leave behind? Well, what is it going to be? Atharul Arda. Wa amaruha aktharam imma amaruha. And they developed it and built it and enhanced it way more than you ever, than they, the Quraysh ever did. They had way better road systems, they had way better irrigation systems, way better technology, way better res. You know, housing standards, way, way more sophisticated cities than you could ever build. You can't, you can't even imagine that stuff. You're a bunch of Bedouins. You just do trade in the desert. And you think you have power? What is Allah telling us in these ayat? Whenever someone thinks they're, when they're about to get drunk on their power, Allah gives a very simple reminder. Whatever power you think you have, I have given much more to those who came before you. And how, how did I deal with those people who I gave that power to? When they got drunk on their power. And messengers came to them with clear proofs too. When they were at the height of their power, Allah sent them messengers. And when Allah sent them messengers, and one of the fundamental goals of a messenger is to introduce people to Allah, which means it is to humble you, right? Humble you in front of Allah. When people have a lot of power, it's very hard for them to become what? To become humble. Right? So when Allah sent messengers to them, فَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَظْلِمَهُمْ Allah wasn't one to do wrong to them. They were doing wrong to themselves. Everything was going right. All the power was there. The only thing was they were in denial of the ayat of Allah. The more, the more drunk on their power they became, they became their own gods instead of worshipping the true God. That's what happened to them. That's when, that's when even the word of Allah wouldn't matter to them. The messengers of Allah didn't, weren't relevant to them anymore. 
And as a result of that, Allah says, that's why they look like ruins today. And Allah allowed for the, those ruins to survive. Wonder about that. Allah allowed for those broken colosseia of the Roman Empire and the pyramids of the Egyptians and the sphinxes. Allah allowed for these ancient temples that are thousands of years old, built by some very powerful people clearly, because they had a lot of people working for them to build these things. Allah allowed those ruins to survive so you and I can see ourselves in those ruins. So we can see no matter how much we accomplish in this world, that was never the goal. That, the, for, the, for the people for whom this was the goal, well, they came and they left, and now that's just ruins. And you're not going to escape that. If that's your goal, then you and your goal will be a ruin. That's all it will be. This is what Dhul Qarnayn is so clear about. He built a wall too, right? He built a wall. And he was clear that he's building a wall in service to people, not as a mark of his power. And not this wall shall stand through the ages and people shall remember the great king and none of that. You know why? Because when he built it, he said, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي جَعَلَهُ دَكَّاءُ وَكَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي حَقَّةُ He said, when the promise of my master comes, Allah will crush this wall. He'll turn it into something crushed. It won't exist anymore. The promise of my master is true. Meaning this serves a purpose. And so long as it serves a purpose, Allah will let it survive. And when it's done serving its purpose, it will be gone. And it being gone will not be a commentary on, oh, the king didn't build that good of a wall. Or it's an insult to the king that the, this monument shall no longer stand, this wall shall no longer stand. He's not looking at it as his, his own accomplishment. He's looking at it as, as a service that he was allowed to do by Allah's permission to help people. That's what power is for, helping people. That's what its purpose is. And so when we have a lot or a little, the way we see power shouldn't change. The end point of my khutbah today is the following. Allah Azza wa where I started, Allah has given all of us some degree of power. All of us. Which means all of us can get infected with the same kind of complex of wanting to of wanting other people to recognize our power. And we need to, you know, vaccinate ourselves, pun intended, from that disease. And we need to understand the power that Allah has given us is first and foremost, it's deserving that we are thankful to Him. That we're thankful to Allah for the ability that He's given us. And then that we should do something good with it for others. That's, that's what the purpose of power is. And that's really beautifully encapsulated in the dua of, you know, the dua elsewhere. Inshallah, I'll share that with you eventually. Master, empower me so I can be grateful. Right, that's how the dua begins. So do that study of your on your own, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa' wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazeen astafa' khususan ala abdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in qala Allahu azza wa jal fi kitabihi al-kareem بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقل الصلاة إن الصلاة تنه... كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا الله أكبر الله أكبر شهد لا 